Welcome back to the Apology Podcast. I'm Jesse Pearson, the founder and editor of Apology Magazine. Today's guest is the chef, restaurant owner, writer, and musician Brooks Headley. I knew of Brooks way before I knew him personally since he played drums in a number of punk bands that I was a fan of. Foremost among those would be Born Against, but he also played in Universal Order of Armageddon, Skull Control, Young Pioneers, and Wrangler Brutes, and more. When I heard in like 2009 that this punk drummer had become the head pastry chef of the extremely fancy Italian restaurant Del Posto in New York, I remember being really excited at the idea of those two very specific and rarefied worlds, you know, hardcore punk on one side and fine dining on the other, overlapping in whatever Brooks was gonna do. So his former bandmate and uh, the writer Sam McFeeters wrote a profile of him for the magazine I was editing back then. Soon after that, Brooks and I became friends and I started to eat his food, which has fully opened my mind up to new ways of looking at the whole idea of cooking and of eating and of hospitality even. Brooks's work at Del Posto mixed up extremely sophisticated technique with extremely unpretentious ways of presenting things like cookies, for example. Uh, Brooks won the James Beard Award for Outstanding Pastry Chef in 2013. And after that, he could have settled into a long, safe, lucrative career. But instead, he left Del Posto and he opened up his own veggie burger joint across town in the East Village. It's called Superiority Burger, and it's likely you've heard of it, even if you haven't had a chance to eat there yet. Uh, what he does there is a miracle. He takes the DNA of the kind of punk and hippie food of his youth, the kind of vegetarian fare you're handed in like a smelly squat on tour or like a hippie joint on St. Mark's Place in the 1990s or something, but he elevates that food where it needed to be elevated while letting its essence kind of remain. Um, he makes the best veggie burger you'll ever taste, no debate. Uh, and he was nominated for another James Beard Award this year in the Best Chef New York City category for his work at Superiority Burger. Brooks is also a great writer and conceptualizer. He did a piece for an early issue of Apology where he interpreted the discography of Black Flag in various desserts. And his two cookbooks are totally readable outside of the kitchen. Um, and Brooks himself is also a big reader, so let's hear what he has to say. Apology Podcast, Brooks Headley. So, um, what are you reading right now? I actually almost never get to read anymore because I am always either at the restaurant or about to be at the restaurant or have just left the restaurant. And when I, was, when I first started working in restaurants like a million years ago, I remember it was a different time. It was the late 90s. So there was a sous chef that worked at the place where I worked, this fancy Italian restaurant. And I remember like someone, he was eating family meal standing up. And somebody said, why don't you sit down and, and enjoy your, your lunch or whatever? And he went, if I sit down, I fall asleep. Like, and kind of in the angriest way possible. Right. So uh, I kind of have that problem with books and movies lately in that, it's working at the restaurant, especially because it's, it's my restaurant now. It's so on the whole time that when I start to like go down or yeah. Peter, like power down or whatever, you know, it's like almost like instant, like I'm out, you know. I actually just flew to LA today and being on a plane is one of those times when I actually do get to read in a way where Obviously, there's no interruptions of any kind. And I also can't, I've never really been able to sleep on a plane. No way. Um, so it's kind of sort of magical when I do get to fly, especially, say, from New York to L.A., because yeah. I get, you know, six hours of just time to read. So It's like the last vestige of, like, actual me time in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, you can you know, rent the Wi-Fi or whatever. But yeah. even if you were, I don't know, even if you were really busy or really needed to be in touch, there's something almost like like underwear in a vending machine and like an alley in Tokyo about about like paying for Wi-Fi like on an airplane. Soiled, soiled Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's just like there's something just sorted and weird about it, you know? Right, so, right. Um, 
Because it's just just something about like pulling out your credit card that you're like sitting on, and, you and swipe then, it in the back of the seat in front of you, right? Often, and, you yeah, know. or, or you know, like trying to type into your yeah. your phone like your credit card number, and then you're like, wait a second, this can't be in any way secure, no. like, at all, you know. Yeah. So, all of that said, I um, I did get to knock out a good chunk of uh, the Mars Room, the Rachel Kushner, oh, Rachel book. Kushner, yeah, yeah. So that was pretty exciting to the point that. When we did land, we I flew into Burbank today. So when we did land, when we were about to land, I I have a thing on airplanes where I really, really like to look out the window. Like mm-hmm. even as a pushing forty seven year old man, it sort of bums me out if I'm on, if I don't have a window seat yeah. and someone has the the slat down. Yeah, especially yeah. when you're landing and it's daylight, or even if it's not daylight. Like I just love looking at the landscape, especially like flying into L.A. because it's sort of you know. Old Testament, and then all of a sudden there's city, and then one minute later you're on the ground. You yeah, know? you're in like the Old Testament desert, and then you see Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> in the distance. Right? No, it's amazing. I, yeah, I love it. But uh, so. especially Burbank too. I love Burbank because you fly into that like a soup bowl, kind of surrounded by the hills. It's different from LAX. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. And um, so I actually like when I knew that was about to happen today, I was sort of bummed that I had to stop reading, but it was also like. I'm on. I'm sitting on the plane, and there's these two things that I really love that I don't get to ever do, which is read a book and look out the window of an airplane. So yeah, yeah, you know, was, they were sort of conflicting there at the end, and then yeah. you know, and then we landed, and my phone comes back on, and there's like a thousand emails from from New York City. So and you, ki- <laughs> you kiss reading goodbye until the next time you're on a plane. Uh, well, actually, like I'm I'm out here to do an event, so I actually have some chunks of downtime where I'm not. At the restaurant, so I could conceivably like sit down for like an hour here and there and just like read a couple more chapters. So, do you have a minimum amount in terms of time that you need to read to really start to absorb, or can you just pop off a chapter real quick if you're like on the subway, or do you need to sit for like an hour and get into a mode? Kind I kind of, I kind of need to sit and kind of get into a mode. Um, depends on, I guess it depends on the book, really. Mm-hmm. If it's something that's just really zippy and just kind of kicking along, then I could, I guess I could like kind of stop and just read a couple, read a couple chapters or read a few pages and then go yeah, back to it. Yeah. But usually what happens is wherever the bookmark happens to be of the last book that I was reading, I kind of have to, I'll open it up and have no idea what's going on and yeah, have yeah. to go back maybe like 10 pages and then just keep flipping and then you're like, oh, all right, that's where I, yeah. that's what, that's the last thing yeah. I remember. And then you're like, what the fuck was I doing for these last 10 pages anyway? I was obviously thinking about like ordering radicchio anyway, so I should have been like, I should have stopped there. Yeah. You know, so. That's like the book equivalent of like when you're watching a TV series and you see like the recap of last episode, sure. last time on The Wire. Uh, I like Rachel Kushner. I included her in a piece I did for Lucky Peach in their last issue, their final issue actually. Oh, cool, yeah. I yeah. surveyed uh, various LA people about their most, not their favorite, but their most LA restaurant. Oh, shit. or most LA dish. I haven't. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta see that. I'll grab it for you. Um, she did uh, the salad niçoise at Tykes. Okay. In uh, in Los Feliz, but yeah, she's cool. What do you think of that book? It's got a, like a p- female punk Berkeley punk protagonist or something. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm super, totally into it at this point. Like, and especially like after getting another chunk finished on the plane today. Um, what made you grab that? How do you choose a fiction book? I guess is is the larger question. Uh, I mean, I read her. I read Flamethrowers yeah. a couple of years ago, which also on a plane, and that one was cool and fun because at the time I was working at a restaurant in northern Italy, like way way northern Italy in Friuli, like almost in Slovenia. Um, but a lot of times I would fly into Milan and then transfer, right? Or fly into Milan or Venice and then transfer either by train or another plane to get to Northern Italy. And a lot of that book takes place, you know, yeah. in, in Italy. So all those like political radicals. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it was like, it was fun to read, like knowing that I had just left right. the Italian peninsula or was about to go there, you know? So, yeah. and that was, I think I was reading that when I was in the process of um, finishing up the writing for fancy desserts, the mm-hmm. cookbook, that, your the first, first cookbook. cookbook. Um, to the point where, like, I w- it was the kind of one of those things where I was reading something and I kept getting so excited about, like, certain phrases or words or things like that that 
and I happened to have like post-its on me from editing the cookbook. Yeah. So my copy of the flamethrowers has orange post-its like all throughout. Yeah. As I, cause I was also, you know, sitting on a plane. I had time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Of just like little things of like certain phrases or I don't know, there was one and occasionally, and I, so I'm reading this book that's, you know, really, you know, passionately written and takes place in Italy and I'm in Italy and then the, occasionally some food things would sneak in. Right. Um, and I think there was, there's something about, I just remember a specific line about was a woman's hairdo that was somehow compared to like the roll, the like lamination on a croissant or something. I can't remember the exact yeah. line, but uh, it was one of those things where I read it and like, you know, like shot up on the plane where yeah. like you're on a plane, you're, you're stuck in the seat, but all of a sudden you're like, this is amazing. Like, what? I, 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 I gotta get out of here. Like, I gotta go. I gotta go do something. You know? I gotta like, go make a croissant. Yeah, I gotta. I just. I gotta. I got. I can't just. I can't just be like locked in here. You know. So, have you always traveled with books? Like, when you were in bands touring in in, in a van, did would you have a book with you? Um, I think I always had a book, but also going back to the looking out the window thing, um, when I did. When I was in bands that did massive tours of the U.S. where it was crazy long drives, like, you know, where you play Rapid City, South Dakota, and then the next show is in Missoula, Montana, and that's a 14-hour drive, which how do you get from one place to the next to get to the venue or the kid's house or the VFW hall to play a show if the drive itself is 14 hours? Right. 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 And we, we would never, like, leave at that end of the night and drive through the night, it would always just wake up super early. So that's pretty long, you know, that's a lot of, that is completely downtime, especially if you're driving through, you know, South Dakota and Montana. So you would think yeah. that like a book would be, you read a hundred books, you know? Yeah. Um, I always would bring something, but then in the same way where I like to look out the window when we're, when you're landing in an airplane, also, and I think I want to say this is true for a lot of people that are in bands that go on tour, like, or maybe there is to a certain point and you get bored of it. But I just, especially growing up on the East Coast, like anything that doesn't look like the East Coast is amazing. Yeah. Because, you know, the U.S. is so big and there's so much things that are not at all like what you're where you grew up. Right. So if you're driving through the Badlands or or even like kind of like desolate strange parts of Montana. Like it's so, it's like you're on another planet. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I always ended up kind of just daydreaming and looking out the window. Yeah. So, and we'd get home and you know, the bookmark would be on page four, you know? Right. Yeah. I've driven through uh, Montana and it's kind of like flying because it's like looking down at like undulating clouds, just all those kind of like hilly kind of prairie sure. looking yeah, yeah, landscape yeah. out there. It's really hypnotic. Right. You mentioned being an East Coaster and finding other parts of the country exotic. Oh, still do. Are you like, I find, I moved to LA only three years ago. And I find the valley really exotic. Right. Like I'm in love with the San Fernando Valley. Right, you're, you're talking my language because I, uh, I also do. And this is a fairly new thing. So. Yeah. Um, what do you like about it? I like that it's, the thing about the San Fernando Valley specifically certain pockets of it, it feels like there's no, and I'm not claiming in any way to be an expert on the San Fernando Valley, but there's certain pockets where you, you're driving around or you go to a restaurant or something and like you look around and there's no chains. It's just weird, old stuff. That's interesting. Um, you're right. And then there are pockets where, it, you know, there it's you feel like you're in the suburbs, but yeah. then there's you take a left turn and all of a sudden it's a crazy old Middle Eastern restaurant where there's the within a shopping center where there's two people like almost in coming to blows over the the last parking space uh -huh. that obviously I think maybe both work at the at the restaurant yeah and then you know a, a, a liquor store that's as big as you know the biggest apartment in New York City across the street with yeah. a huge sign yeah um, and uh, there's or there's just I don't know, you know, a VCR repair store that's still in business. Yeah, you know? yeah. So uh, that's exactly how I feel about it. I think that, and it's probably because we're around the same age. I feel a lot, of, a lot of nostalgia when I'm there because it feels like parts of the valley, much of the valley, is kind of frozen between like 1977 and like 1982. 
Sure. Yeah. It's like Boogie Nights, basically. <laughs> it, you know, it just spans yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, so it, it just makes me feel like I'm a kid again. It's, it's kind of romantic or something. Yeah. Yeah. To I completely agree. And I, I did grow up in like the, the kind of darkest suburbs of Baltimore, but it, it didn't feel like that. Like it felt very, very different kind of sort of suburban upbringing and even like the way the, the buildings looked and the cars looked and everything. But yeah, there's something about the valley that's, yeah, it's like parts of it are just like kind of captured in this time when, like you said, 77 to 82, that would be, that would have been when like everything became interesting to me you know, right. as a kid. That's you know, when so. you're developing your consciousness of the world. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Who are some of your favorite hardcore lyricists? <laughs> it's funny because usually when it comes to like punk bands and lyrics and singing, I don't necessarily always look at like, like read the lyric sheet and think like, I like this band because of the lyrics. Yeah. Like a lot of times if it's, if it's particularly crazy or aggressive music. And when I say aggressive, I don't mean like tough guy aggressive, like, like Chrome can be aggressive, yeah. you know, or like, you know, I've always kind of gravitated towards when it comes to like hardcore and punk, like the, like the freaks as opposed to, yeah. cause a lot of times if people talk about, it, it happens to me all the time at the restaurant. If we, somebody starts working at the restaurant cause we attract a lot of people that are in bands or like kind of like, loud music, you know, and they'll mention, you know, like a New Jersey hardcore band from the late nineties that I know nothing about. Right. And they'll go, well, you, you of course love that band, right? Like the, I don't I, I, I don't I can't think of the hate brothers or something, you know, like, <laughs> but, and I'm like, uh, in my mind, what I know about them is I think I saw some shorts and some right. shaved heads and varsity like, look, the varsity, the varsity look, look yeah. and like maybe some definitely like that chugga chugga guitar mm -hmm. sound, which I find totally boring, you know, yeah, yeah. unless it's framed within like a, a freakazoid thing, like where, you know, something like Man is the Bastard. Totally different. Totally different vibe, Obviously, even though yeah. like the layperson might hear both of those bands together and say, yeah. oh, they sound the same. You know? So the weirdos, you're talking about more that, or like you you counter those kids with, here, listen to No Trend. and, and Yeah, yeah, something. listen to No Trend, listen to Flipper. Like, you yeah. know, what was that? Uh, lately, I have I was cleaning out my, finally got all my records back after a, a bunch of years of them just being stored at other people's houses. Yeah. God, you were able to keep track of where everything was? <laughs> I was able to keep track at the same time um, most of them were at my friend Christian's house in Baltimore for a long time. And he, uh, he specifically like, at, there's a certain point if you're, if you have a bunch of your records at your friend's house, you're you going to make like a Brooks section of the shelf or yeah, something. You're going to, some of those records are going to be incorporated into your collection oh, because right. Right. there's a statute of limitations as, as to how long they can stay. Right. So I of course went to pick them up and I flipped them through and my, uh, no trend when death won't solve your problems LP was not, was missing. And of course, that's my one of my favorite records, and I found it immediately in his collection. And then we had an argument there on the site <laughs> about how that was my record, and he said, "No, it's his." Right. And, you know, we went back and forth, yeah. and then I backed down, realizing that those records had been there for eight years. And in a way, they were his children now. They right. Like, you can't leave a cat at someone's house exactly. for that long, and it doesn't become no, no, not at all. You should have green taped them like Maximum Rock and Roll, <laughs> <laughs> all the Brooks records. I uh, yeah, actually, um, the uh, the publisher of Fancy Desserts put out a paperback version of that book um, after the fact and changed the cover. Yeah. As a, I think as a way to like maybe try to sell sell more copies of it. I don't think the trick really worked because I don't think there was any demand for mo more of those books. You yeah. Know? There was enough already. And the, the inside looks the same. So I actually had um, Zach this uh, guy who worked the register mm -hmm. who does kind of crazy illustrations at the restaurant, I actually had him make a new cover. And I have, I think, 40 copies of this paperback with this cover I truly despise. Yeah. Um, so I had him make a new cover and we're, we figured out a way to like kind of like wheat paste it to oh, wow. the paperback. Yeah. But then 
I think the testers that we did, we were going to sell them for like 10 bucks. Like Zach gets five bucks, I get five bucks. Right. Because um, the inside is totally the same. It's just, it's almost like a weird bait and switch. It's thing. like a collector's kind of thing, if you really, if you care. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we won't sell any, or maybe well, there's only 40, so who knows. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, we realized you could probably just peel the cover off. So the, the end plan was to tape the corners like, with green gorilla uh-huh. tape like maximum rock and roll so it would be actually be impossible right to like find to get to make your way one layer into the real cup that's smart for listeners who don't know what we're talking about maximum rock and roll the venerable punk zine has probably the biggest punk and hardcore archive in the world and they sure. put ever since tim yohan and the founders days they tape all their records with green tape on all sides so you know it's from mrr right so and it's like kind of like multi-purpose that you know it's from MRR if it like if someone was to steal it and ended up at like the Amoeba in Berkeley or something. Right, right. But also it sort of renders the expensive punk records worthless because yeah, you it's got tape on it, and if you try to peel the tape off, it destroys. The I punk. never thought of that. It make it de it de commodifies them. De- yes, totally, totally. That's really smart. It also and it also makes it because I've done the radio show there um, before, and you have to like. It, the records are packed so tightly down this long hallway that when you pull them out, like the glue gets on your fingers yeah, and yeah. is on like the edges of the records. Wow. And then once you do the radio show, you know, it's the maximum rock and roll house. You have to put everything back in right. exactly the right order, right. which is like a total pain in the ass because you're trying to squeeze these, like, you know, <laughs> this awesome Dick's record back in the, the DI section, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and there's the tapes getting everywhere. So, yeah. But the funny thing about like the 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 fact that the publisher changed the cover of that book t- because they thought that it would sell more copies, uh, and then I think it didn't. Like that's another thing that and when it comes to books that I think about a lot are are like the covers. Like it, especially because living in New York, you get to go. One of the I mean, one of the greatest things about living in New York is, is the Strand is right there. Yeah, know? and I live a few blocks from it. Yeah, and. Just getting to go and everything is kind of displayed with like the brand new books or even like classic books with the covers on top. Yeah, so yeah. It's I always find myself scanning them and then sometimes thinking like, why would they? This book, this this book is incredible. Like, what are they thinking with this cover? Like, yeah. like what? I don't understand. What's the point? You know. So yeah, there's a real disconnect I think often between what's actually in a book and what the cover designers or the publishers decide it should look like. Because of genre stuff a lot of the time, category slash genre. Right, right, you know? right. But wait, hardcore lyrics. Oh, yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, we, we drifted off that. So, like, are you saying that you think, the, the, as, a, as a drummer, does the voice just become more of a percussive thing to you, like another element of the, of the bigger picture? And you don't um, really... Sometimes, yeah. yeah, sometimes. And sometimes, like... Sometimes the lyrics just don't matter. Yeah. To me, at least, like the, if if I really like a song or a band, um, and I like the the way that the singer ha- is delivering the 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 words, then I won't particularly care too much. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, there are there definitely are certain bands where the lyrics are so good and so clever and so or may, and usually so strange or so weird for yeah. whatever reason yeah. that you start to like them because of that. Like, yeah. like I think, man, once again, Man is a Bastard is a perfect example of that. Right. Like, like I was looking at the, you know, Charred Remains, Pink Turds in Space 7-inch uh-huh. the other day and looking at the lyric sheet, which I hadn't, like, looked at the lyric sheet in a while and I'm, I was just thinking, like, these lyrics are incredible. Like they're so yeah. like this is such like fight music, but in in like this weird freaky guys that basically almost live in the desert desert way, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not like New York hardcore Cro-Mags fight music. It's like desert rat post apocalypse fight music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. Mad Max. Specifically in like relating to that, the um Adam from Born Against and Young Pioneers, who I was in several bands with, he there was that thing in the 90s, maybe even pushing into the 2000s. It was like a festival, like a punk festival in Ohio called the More Than Music Festival. His thing was all, would always be like, like more than music, then what? Huh? Like, is, <laughs> is, 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 is it just Man is the Bastard that's playing? Because all these other bands, that's, they're literally just music. Right. You know? And maybe not even music, you know? So 
we had lots of uh, positive conversations and you know. <laughs> Men as a Bastard is really good at song titles too. Like just incredible, evocative. Incredible. Like uh, I always think of their song title, um, The Kosher Grimace. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Or it says so much. Like and they can they they were able to get away with such like weird minimalist both music and and song titles like yeah. the song the arena yeah you know, like the, the and, song the title is the arena and but if you know man as the bastard and you hear them say we have a song called the arena it conjures up a lot right like thunderdome basically sure yeah or like the other they had another song uh was it the roller the roller which you even when you say it like roller like the roller what about puppy mill they have puppy a song mill. called puppy I mean, mill the lyrics yeah. and puppy mill are incredible i think do you remember can you quote can you quote puppy mill i can actually yeah puppy mill is like I think it goes mutant breeders, cash receivers, something, something. Um, such a great song. It's just like, yeah. you know, it's this song about this like intensely ant pro animal rights song. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. Or what's that's the fate of man's best friend, I think is that's like so one good. Of the last lines, you know? Yeah. It's oh, great. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Cause it's like, like, Concrete socks for all you swine, referring for yeah. referring to the like the the breeders, the breeders yeah. you know. So yeah, that's cool. Exactly. <laughs> or like, uh, like I don't know, like a band like Fugazi. Like I yeah. still to this day love Fugazi. Yeah, but I don't. I've never really paid much attention to the lyrics. Yeah. Like for them, that's the the vocals for that band. The vocals to me just become kind of part of the like a percussive element of the song. I hear that. Unless it's a particularly like. Like there are some kind of, Fugazi songs where the message is so clear, like you are not what you own, that sure, you kind of sure, can't sure, sure, sure. get it, you know. Or, or like you know, uh, you make a great cop, you pig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is an ama- an right. incredible line, you know. Amazing. So yeah, I think it's the gee stuff that gets a little bit more. But I but it's not like about a, mood, right? But me. I'm not for saying, me. For me, yeah. Well, for me too. But it's at the same time, like I'm not like I don't dislike those songs in any no, way. I love them, love them, love them, love yeah. them. But then that's like it's sort of like. I mean, as a drummer, you know, what I, what I play, what I would play on drums, like, is kind of this very personal thing because it's, I don't think of myself as playing drums and like being a totally original thing. I was all, throughout my life, I was always like, well, I really like this band right now or this band. So I'm going to sort of weirdly try to emulate them. Right. And this is what comes out, you know? So that's a, that's an intensely personal thing. Like yeah. nobody listened to Universal Order of Armageddon and realized how much I loved the band Mule at that point. Right. Or Super Chunk. Right. You know? That's but, interesting. But in my mind, so that's like, and when you're a lyricist, you're writing lyrics and singing them, like yeah. that's also a pretty personal thing, even way more personal, obviously, because there's nothing to hide behind. Like I'm, yeah. I can sit in the back and just like, wail on things you know i mean yeah any kind of lay person i think feels more qualified to scrutinize lyrics than they do to scrutinize a drummer's decisions sure yeah yeah. i want to talk a little bit about your reading history when you were first discovering punk and hardcore, what were the things you were reading that were going along with that? Um, that I mean, I discovered all that stuff in high school. And it's, it's sort of funny to think about now because I always, like I ended up, it took a million years to finish, but I eventually did get a college degree in writing by the end of the 90s. Um, but I, yeah, I was constantly reading. No matter what I was, it was in high school or college or whatever, like it always kind of ended up back at like Shakespeare. Wow. So, you know, especially when I first discovered like Black Flag or, you know, the Crucifix or something like that, like uh-huh. I was really into the imagery and with especially, or the Dead Kennedys, especially with those bands, like that, that was a whole package where like it was the words and the music and the record covers, like right. all became this thing where it was incredibly interesting. Um, but if I was at school, it was like, you know, I was reading, you know, Measure for Measure, The Merchant of Venice, yeah. um, which I still to this day, like ended up, even in college, like ended up reading more Shakespeare than like more modern literature to get my degree. Um, and I'm, 
I've, it's hard to even say like why it just kind of, I just always kind of went back to that. Yeah. Um, maybe something about the fact that it was like written in verse. Yeah. Um, there was like a percussive element about it too, yeah. with the way the words are strung together. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Yeah. yeah it's all you know, rhythm to it. um, and then especially like, you know, when beyond like kind of like, Minor Threat, Dead Kennedys, like stuff like that, that when you're a kid, those are the things that initially hit you. Yeah. You know, kind of taking a turn here and there and getting into, you know, Flipper, No Trend, or The Birthday Party, or things that all of a sudden started to get immediately weirder and darker. Yeah. Um, and then be reading, you know, a Shakespeare play where really fucked up shit is going on. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, it kind of like all kind of blended together in a nice way. So That's interesting. I mean, there, yeah, there's enough in Shakespeare if you look at the whole body of work that you can kind of, every tone, every kind of category is in there. I mean, you said there's comedy, there's measure for measure. Sure, yeah. And then there's, you know, the most brutal war kind of stuff. There's murder, there's patricide, there's all that good stuff. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, All of it. Were you from a bookish household? Were your parents big readers? My mom was a school teacher, so uh -huh. she read constantly um, to the point where... She always had a book or a stack of books and she taught elementary school. So she wasn't necessarily teaching the book she was reading to her kids. But I, I do remember that, yeah, she, she was always, always reading and to the point where she was a school teacher. So she had her summers off and if she didn't have a second job during the summer, which she usually did, even if she did, she would always go on rent a, a house in the, the Eastern shore of Maryland with all of her teacher friends. And I always remember that specifically I would watch her packing up and that's when she would pack up her like kind of like tra more trashy yeah. things to read yeah. because this was like, this is like what I'm going to read while I'm hanging out with, yeah. hanging out with the girls at the beach, you know, so. What kind of stuff? Like um, crime thrillers or yeah, romance or? Just like the, you know, like stuff that even to this day, if you mentioned to her, she'd just be like, Whew, yeah, that was a stinker, huh? You know, like, <laughs> but it was just more like, as opposed to. I, I don't know what the equivalent would be today. Yeah. Not necessarily from a, like sitting on the beach and just watching like, you know, <laughs> like YouTube videos of people pruning their trees and yeah. getting hurt or something, you know, like. <laughs> That's replaced like Dick Francis and Elmore Leonard for a lot of people. Yeah. You know what? Not to conflate Dick Francis and Elmore Leonard. They're totally different levels of Elmore Leonard is incredible. Dick Francis is kind of workmanlike. So just for the record, I want to say, got it, got it. I'm, not, I'm not putting them in exactly the same bucket. Um, so, so you were reading Shakespeare when you were discovering punk. Right. And like, and then throughout the time of my like musical interest and development, it was always kind of around and like yeah. to the point where I finally did get my degree at the university of Maryland, I had an advisor and she was basically like, you got to read some other stuff, you know, some stuff that came after. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, um, but it was just kind of funny because at the same time she's like, well, "This is, I mean, don't get me wrong, this is this is good, but you know." Yeah. Um, Have you seen any uh, any good live Shakespeare? Any good, you know? Like no, I mean that's the thing. Like it, it sucks because this, it's one of the the like sucky things about living in New York City is unless you, a lot of times you live in New York City and you're constantly working, whether right. that's like me for I work at my own thing, or you're working for someone else. Like, but your time is you're in this huge cultural center where there's all yeah. sorts of stuff going on constantly. And right. like, it always kind of like, so I haven't, I haven't. And I really, it's like, even you mentioning it, it was like, Oh shit, I should have <laughs> gone to that thing last year, the thing this summer, you know, yeah. but, um, it does make me happy. People will from out of town, especially will come to superiority burger to hang out, have a snack or have dinner or lunch or whatever. And, yeah. then, and then say like, Oh, we're going to the, we're going to this show. Yeah. You know, we got to leave. We're going to the show. And that always makes me really happy. It's great. So. It is one of the big ironies of New York is you have to work your ass off to survive there. And so all this great culture is right around you all the time, but you can't often make the time or afford it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's well, it's cool. It's not, I mean, it's cool and funny. I have a lot of folks that have moved to New York almost specifically to work at Superiority Burger because it's such a strange, weird, tiny restaurant. That's not like other places. Yeah. Um, so we tend to attract a certain kind of person that wants to work at the restaurant, yeah. which I love, 
and it's a vegetarian restaurant, but a lot of times the people aren't vegetarian, or even if they are, they're they're sp- they're just they're kind of weirdos in this like way that I really like. Yeah, you know, even though I work every day, and even though I worked every day, even when I worked for other people, yeah, and still do that now, maybe even more so because it's my thing now. Yeah, um, it's very important to me that the people that work for me don't do that, like that they definitely get two days off in a row, hopefully, or maybe their days are split up for whatever reason. There's right. a, a specific thing they have to be, but that they have two full solid days off. And I know that sounds crazy because most people in the world have two full solid days yeah, off. Yeah, but not in the restaurant world. So. No, it's yeah. just not. And like I came from, like I started doing it in the late 90s and worked throughout the 2000s to now. I don't really care, you know, because... It had been kind of ingrained in my head. This, this is just what you do. Right. So it doesn't bother me. I mean, when I first started it, maybe I would get upset that I couldn't see a, uh, couldn't go to a certain show, you yeah. know. And then I kind of stopped paying attention to music for a little while because I was just way more interested in cooking and food anyway. Yeah. But that's my own sort of psychopathic tendency. Is like I, <laughs> I really, it's really important to me that the people that work for me like definitely have free time, especially if they've just moved to New York to go do stuff, you know? Yeah. I just encourage them. I was like, just go walk. If you don't have any money, just go walk around. If like you saved up enough money, like go to a show, like, you know, do something that like reminds you that you're living in New York and you're not just waking up and then coming to work in the restaurant. Do you ever worry that being so kind to them is going to make them get destroyed when they move on to another kitchen that's more traditional about (laughs) about these things? I mean, it it might. It might. But, you know, I also maybe then... In the back of my mind, my feeling is like they look back on working at Superiority Burger and go like, "Wow, that was, like what, I miss what, I miss Brooks." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right. Um, so yeah, hopefully it works out that way. So. so you studied creative writing or English? I mean, what, what was the focus of your of your degree? Um, it was writing? it was it was a lot of writing. What kind? Um, it was a lot of kind of uh, like essays, kind of things where it could be necess- It would it could be about all sorts of things, depending on what the, the, the class was at the time. But I always, it was always my favorite thing to do. And I think writing, you mean? Yeah. 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 I definitely, I, I weirdly pref, I, I definitely prefer writing to reading, if that makes any sense, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, uh, I think you're in the minority <laughs> on that, but yeah. Um, so it was a lot of like, when the the two cookbooks that I have done, like the like the kind of writing in those books, that was the thing that I always, have always liked, you right. know. Um, and for at least for the Superiority Burger Cookbook, which is newer, I tried to like maybe not go like keep it a, like tightened up a little, so it's not. Fancy Desserts was kind of supposed to be like a book of essays, as opposed to the Superiority Burger book, which is. Real, I, I kind of wanted it to just be like a, a real cookbook yeah. with like tiny little concise, short um, head notes yep. for each recipe that were maybe only a sentence or two or three sentences or something. Right. You know? As opposed to like, oh, I'm going to talk for, you know, 10 paragraphs about eggplant or something. Right. Like that, so. I like that. Um, so it's like a personal essay kind of a vibe. I think it used to be called literary nonfiction. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, school. that was the thing that always, I guess that's previous to doing a lot of that stuff in school. Mm-hmm. That was the kind of thing that I always liked to read. You know? Who were some writers that were models for you in that, um, in that world? Uh, I mean, honestly, like, and it's, it's, it's weird because it directly relates to food long before I ever became involved in food professionally is, um, A.J. Liebling, uh-huh. the New Yorker writer. Yeah. And, you know, because I guess he was writing, like, since the 30s, 20s, maybe? I or, think or definitely the 30s, if not, probably the 30s. Okay. But don't quote me. Um, but the first few things that I read of his were things about food. Right. And then that led to other things where he wrote about World War II. And then... Um, he wrote some of my favorite stuff about boxing ever. Yes, yes. Yeah. The the book The Sweet Science. Yeah. Which is like even I can still go back and read, say, like the first three pages of that book. Yeah. And it's just like knocks my socks off, you it's know. Incredible. Like, yeah. Um to the point where I don't 
care at all about boxing. Like at all. Like I have no interest in it at all. But for some to read someone someone's someone that can write that masterfully about something like that and make you interested in something that you have zero interest in. Maybe you're like not don't even want to know anything right. about. So when, when you were in school, in college, was the career goal to be a writer? Is that what you were thinking at that point? I've never, I've never really had any sort of plan ever for anything. Um, so I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think I li- it was something that I liked to do. But there wasn't any plan to specifically do that. Yeah. So I remember because when I fi- finally did graduate from college with a, with a, a writing degree... Um, I didn't, I mean, my mom bought me a suit and, and then I tried to get a job in DC and doing what, I guess anything. Cause I just needed, I, 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 the, at the time I was in a band called skull control and that band had broken up. And at the same time I'd graduated from college finally. Um, but I didn't have any plan at all. Yeah. So I just, I guess I just did what I thought I was supposed to do, which is like put on a suit and apply for a bunch of jobs that I could or couldn't get, you know? Yeah. And I had an office job for a couple of weeks at like where they, it was like somewhere on, I think it was on 16th street actually, like not that far from the white house. Yeah. At a, I don't even remember what the place was, <laughs> but I remember they, they stuck me in a room that was a very small room with just manila folders of papers shooting out everywhere. Uh-huh. And they were basically like organize it, oh but God. I had no idea what anything was. And obviously this was like the least important thing that needed to be done. Yeah. And I was the least important person uh-huh. at this place. Yeah. So they just put me in the room and I just remember like taking a lot of breaks and going yeah. to get water and then walking back in and trying to make sense of like some papers here and there. That's like something from Kafka, being told to organize a room full of middle envelopes with no organizing principles being given to you. Just no, zero. Figure it out. And I remember specifically like there was one of those um, those stools that from libraries, the, like yeah. the metal stools that were kind of round, yeah. sitting on it. And, you know, when it comes to work, like I'm not opposed to work of any kind. I never have been like. Yeah, clearly. Uh, now, even when I was younger, like I was a house painter, um, I would work as much as possible. And if, even if I was in a band, like I would ask to go on tour, I was like, can I have three weeks off? And usually I would, I would just do whatever. Like if, when I was a house painter, you know, they would shove me in the, uh, the bathroom with like oil-based primer, uh-huh. close the door and start laughing at me. And I would, you know, All I, right. I would do everything, you know? Right. And then when I was like, I need three weeks off to go on tour, they would be like, yeah, sure. We'll hold your job for you. Yeah. Um, I'm not opposed to work of any kind, but when I was <laughs> sitting in this office room with all these manila folders, like I just didn't, I didn't have enough structure. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So I just, I, you know, I would like, lean my head against the folders, like kind of peel them apart and find a space that <laughs> wasn't going to like cut me and like lean my head against it and maybe fall asleep for where you fall asleep for like uh, a uh, minute yeah. and you wake up and you're like kind of. It's sh- like those horrible stories you read about like, um, you know, pr- gorillas going insane from boredom and in, 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 in zoos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only had the job for two weeks, so it was definitely yeah. like, and I'd had to wear a tie and, you know, I'd never worn a tie before yeah. and I'd, I still to this day like can't I even if I have to do something where I have to wear a tie and just yeah. doesn't I I don't think I learned how to tie a tie until I was well into my twenties. And I still have to look it up most of the time. I think uh, I, I think I can actually tie a tie pretty well, but I'm not sure why. It doesn't make any sense. Now, someone whoever taught me must have taught me really well. Yeah. So um you were writing for Bon Appetit a little bit in the last couple of years, right? I did, yeah, yeah. I had a that was actually kind of a fun job. What was the what was the kind of directive well they left it pretty open um they the i I think i did maybe a total of like five or six columns and it was a every other month thing um it was definitely really i I could pretty much write about whatever i wanted and it was right when superiority burger had opened so 
I kind of just always wrote about that, like it's some different topic. Like a, there's a column. One of them was about washing dishes, you know. Yeah. Um, another one was actually about writing the cookbook or like trying trying to write the cookbook. Mm. Well, wait. What about what about washing dishes? Oh, I kind of I I love washing dishes. Is um, it a meditative thing or something? Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. But I but I absolutely despise putting dishes away. Uh-huh. And this has been my thing, even when I lived in group houses in Washington D.C., where. You know, it was like six people living in a two-bedroom house and somebody lives in a closet and somebody lives in like yeah. the decrepit basement and somebody lives in the practice room. Um, you know, that amount of people, especially if nobody has any money, yeah. you create a lot of dishes because you're always, everyone's always cooking. We were, of course, everyone was vegan or vegetarian. So, right. you know, it was cheaper to, there wasn't that much stuff you could buy anyway. So it was a lot of cooking for yourself. And yeah. so I would never have any problem doing dishes. I would, I would, you give me a huge mound of dishes, I'll wash them all, but I'll also make another mound of them and then just leave. <laughs> that a roommate then has to put away. Yeah, or like if you pull the the sheet pan out, then the whole thing comes uh-huh. toppling down. And I, I actually got into a pretty multiple times. I, I don't ever drink coffee because it, I love everything about coffee except it makes me insane. Yeah. Um, so I never drink coffee. So yeah. I would always be the person washing you know, the coffee pot and then putting it on this like teetering mound of uh-huh. dishes and of course it would break and then everyone would be like well, well you don't even drink the coffee yeah know? and you just broke and we now we can't now we can't drink coffee yeah but i would never have too much i it was i never had too much sympathy because i didn't drink coffee i didn't understand that some people coffee. that's like taking away a junkie's needle yeah. Yeah, yeah not cool um but even at the restaurant like we we have this amazing dishwasher that we that i love who came in the beginning and has been there almost since the beginning, but we're not really sure where he came from. We think he was referred by one of our old cooks, mm. but at that point, the history gets like sort of sketchy. The genealogy so is hard to understand. We don't know where he came from. Yeah. Um, he changes his phone number a lot, so we never really have a way to contact him. Um, and he takes, he's from the Dominican Republic, so he'll take long trips back home. Right. We, that's what we think. We're not sure. Yeah. But he'll, so even though I love, I love this guy to death and he, when he's there, he does an amazing job. Occasionally at the end of the night, he'll come up to me and ask me, you know, I need the next five months off. And five months. I always say yes, because I, I, I love the guy. Uh-huh. Like he's, he's hilarious and he does such a good job. And also like, you know, every job I had when I was a kid, I never didn't have my job back to go on tour with my, right. with my stupid punk bands you know right, right granted those were three weeks not five months you know? yeah um so i always save his job and we just kind of deal with it like in this part he's in actually in one of those phase, phases right now where we're not quite sure when he's going to come back right um but we know he's going to come back because he always does yeah um so we actually hired on a new guy to do dishes who's in a weird way more efficient uh-huh. um and also also great guy love him and you know when Francisco comes back, we'll definitely like find a way to have them both there. But so there are large chunks of time now where, you know, I am the owner of the restaurant. I guess technically I am the chef of the restaurant, although although it is a very collaborative environment with all of the people working there. But I do a lot of dishes. Um, And I actually don't have a problem with that because I can like, like I don't like working the grill at the restaurant, yeah. the griddle, yeah. because you have to be totally focused and like you can't do anything else. You can't see what's going on this way or that way. As you're part of this machine and you're you're sort of driving the vehicle. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing efficiently, everything breaks down. Right. So whereas doing dishes, like I can do a batch of dishes, get them in the dishwasher, get some sanitizer out. And then I can kind of like poke my head around the corner. Yeah. Maybe go change the trash cans, check out how the room is going because we play, we have an iPod that plays 12 hours a day at the restaurant. Right. Um, which has, I think it's got something like 6,000 songs on it, which seems insane, like for the amount of music, you know, but we're open 12 hours a day. So, it's not that much, it's really. Not that much, yeah, you know? so, especially as, as the years pile up. Right, and then yeah. trying to adjust the music so there's new stuff, but then still the 
stuff that's been on there that is important to me that's on there because uh-huh. I like the way it makes the the room feel. Yeah, yeah. You know, like what? Um, like uh, uh, Captain Sensible. That song, what? Oh, I said Captain. What? It yeah. said what? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's like maybe that's maybe that's not the greatest song in the world. <laughs> no, it's it not. It it's, it's it's not. But it's perfect for like a busy night at the yeah, restaurant. It is where like. Every seat is full. It's just, I mean, this our dining room is small. There's six seats, and if there's like five more people just like waiting to order, mm-hmm. it feels crazy. So, if that song plays, I just get really excited. You, you know? up, yeah. Or like, um, I mean, so a lot of times it's not like the song that I really love. It's just like a song that works in the room. Like, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Gigi Allen, "Don't Talk to Me," uh-huh. also amazing for the room. Wow. Like, not necess- I'm not like the biggest Gigi Allen fan in the world. Yeah, I would hope um, that a chef wouldn't be. Right, but that song specifically just like really works in the room, you know. Like, I get it. It's got an energy. Yeah. Um, do new uh, do new staff members do a double take when they see the chef owner hopping on the dishwasher? Um, not really, because when everyone starts, when people start working at the restaurant, like I always say, here's the deal: we all do dishes. Yeah. Like sometimes we have a dishwasher, sometimes we don't. Um, but we all do dishes and I, it's never like for me, it, you know, the, what's the, what do they say? Like lead by example lead by or example. whatever. Yeah. Um, which I can buy to a certain extent. Like yeah. there's that phrase is used a lot in the fancy restaurant world in a way that I don't totally agree with. But in terms of like our small little six seat vegetarian restaurant, um, yeah, no one really does a double take because they do it too. They already you know? know that that's expected. Yeah, right? it's yeah. like, and it's not expected like you must wash dishes. It's just like, we all, this is, we all got to do it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, Cause there are certain, I've been to kind of fancier restaurants where they have it kind of like built into like an HR uh, employee manual program where if you start off and you have to do like, say like a week in the dish pit. So you understand the toil. What it feels like. What it feels like, right. but then that's it, you know, like. Whereas that's almost like offensive in it a way. Is, it is. Yeah. Like, look how bad it could be. Right. Like you should be glad you're you're working on the floor pouring wine when yeah, yeah, yeah. you might just be stuck in this place that smells like veal, but bu- like <laughs> busted ass, you know, uh-huh. crusted on veal bones, and you're scraping it with a yeah. scraper, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, there's something very satisfying about getting the three compartment sink just like pristine, you know? That's, and then yeah. to the point where you get it to that point, and this is a restaurant, it's busy. I'm like, I'm, and I've made the restaurant chaotic and insane because I want it to be like that, which creates a lot of dishes. So yeah. when, when I'm doing dishes and I finally get it where I'm like, all right, we're good. And then a bunch of crusted on sheet trays just and come like pounding in there. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Come on, you know? And I was like, I created that, you know, so. When I started to think about, um, you know, food and writing, I started to think about kind of um, great meals and literature or books that talk about eating a lot, even though they're not about it. And the first thing that came to mind for me, Tolkien, <laughs> right? They're always yeah, eating. Yeah. And I remember like uh, really wanting to try some of these, like this thing called, what is it, Lembas, like that elven bread that Sam and Frodo have to get, like, get them oh, to Mordor. That's so funny. That's I so always funny. thought about wanting to try that. Um, I mean, maybe maybe Shakespeare is what you would pull from, but like, do you ever? Yeah, do you, there's definitely there's there's eating in Shakespeare for, for sure. sure yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, what kind of like literary meals come to mind for you if you try to think of a couple? To, let me like off the top of my head. Um, I think it's like for me, like even as a kid, like anytime food was involved in anything, it like piqued my interest. So yeah, whether it was in like. I mean, it can go, I mean, you have one, you know, my mom, like I said, my mom was an elementary school teacher. So like there was a lot of like kind of young adult that like weird sort of like Judy Bloom yeah. style of book, you know, that like that was the stuff that she was like teaching to her kids. So like I would always have, I would always hear about that. I think there was one that was like called How to Eat Fried Worms. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I remember like being (laughs) like very interested, like almost like, you know, she's reading it or 
and I'm sitting there like, hmm, like, so how would you fry the yeah. worm? Like, would you, would it be in some sort of like tempura batter? You know, <laughs> it would just be dredged in flour. Like, I wonder what the, the meat would taste like, you know, what kind of dipping sauce is there, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's inspired. I was going to ask you um, if 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 any books have ever inspired a dish for you. I guess that's the first one. <laughs> but yeah. does reading ever spark? I mean, whether it's nonfiction or fiction or poetry or anything. Um, I don't. I, I wonder. It's it's hard to say. Like anything specifically, in that sense. Um, I think for the most part, the things that like inspire the food that comes about in the restaurant is just like, especially like. Superiority Burger now, like where we get to, we're constantly changing stuff around and everyone that works in the restaurant kind of throws their hat two cents in and right. gets to like do their own thing here and there. Right. It's more like, I don't think, I honestly, I can't think of anything like, like a romantic thing that I was, that I read in like a novel to be like, yeah. you know, we'll do something like this. So. All right. Well, here's another one then. Um, what, what are some sort of like Proust's Madeline foods for you? You know, a taste or a smell that <laughs> brings back a sharp sort of memory. Um, any sort of, um, and saying this as as a as a person who runs a vegetarian restaurant, anytime there's tomato sauce with any sort of meat in it, not meatballs, but like some sort of like hunk of tough meat that like kind of braises in the sauce and kind of turns into like this almost like shredded mess of uh like fibers almost and i didn't i wouldn't even necessarily say it's something that i would want to eat but there's a certain smell that's attached to that what what does it, when does it take you back to it's like something that my mom and grandmother would do and they would they would take like basically like off cuts of meat and throw it in the sauce and it would cook and then become edible through the long cooking. And they, but they never referred to it by any sort of animal name. It was always just kind of like, they just called it spaghetti meat. Spaghetti meat? Right. That's amazing. But it wasn't, so I didn't like, maybe it was beef, maybe it was pork, maybe it was lamb. I don't know because once it was like cooked down into this mess and then in the combination of like the kind of reduced tomatoes and garlic. Yeah which is a very specific smell and a very specific like perfume mm -hmm. in the air of a kitchen or a restaurant. That's one thing, but then combining it with this like long cooked meat smell. Yeah. It's like creates this kind of whole new thing that that's not one, it's not pot roast and it's not yeah. like red sauce. No, know? I think so. there's something like particularly comforting about Italian cooking, the smells of Italian cooking. Oh, sure. There's a, um, on there's that place Arturo's on Houston Street, yeah. Houston and Thompson, and they have, if you walk up Thompson to the back of their restaurant, there's an exhaust hood, and it's basically just spitting out the smell of garlic bread. Yeah, you know? it's like toasted garlic and like this kind of yeasty smell. You know, that's like the best ad campaign you could think of. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like it's like it's funny too because there's other Italian restaurants around there. But they don't make food that smells like the Arturo's exhaust hood. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, who are some food writers or food books that you like? I mean, uh, I think about, we're talking about Italian food. Like, um, I liked Bill Buford's Heat, for example. Sure, yeah, um, I mean, that's... Is there good food writing? You know, do you enjoy reading about that stuff? I do, yeah. No, I mean, like, the thing about food writing is there's a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, just... Just in people that I know pers personally in New York that happen to come into the restaurant or, you know, are in New York a lot, like, I, it, it always kind of amazes me that, like, they're food writers, like, that's how they make their living, like, yeah. it doesn't seem like there's enough to go around, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, uh, Peter Meehan, obviously, since yeah. in Lucky Peach, and other things he's written... New York Times, et cetera, like yeah. has always been one of my favorite writers. Like yeah, even great. even not necessarily like directly about food, like in the same way that like reading the the flamethrowers, like picking up on certain small phrases is just being like, oh, that's I love that mm -hmm. phrase, you know, like mm -hmm. you can tell Peter's really well read in his oh, writing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like widely read. Yeah. Like yeah. all all up and down, all over the map right. kind of thing where right. almost like 
you know, it, to me at least, that's intimidating to even think about. Yeah. Like, like how do you, like, because I, I think about that and I'm like, well, yeah, I want to do that. And it's like, well, how do how do I do that? You know, so <laughs> put in the hours, just, I just, guess. Yeah. Um, or specifically, he wrote some. It was something. It was just like an intro and a Lucky Peach, and I think it, he was saying he was someone was trying to get him to do something that he didn't want to do, and his line was something like not being a fan of doing anything ever, <laughs> which like I still think about today. And I, I think I've probably tried to rip it off a bunch of times, but it's so specific, like, yeah, it would definitely That's get a good back. One. Which, which band between Born Against and UOA was more bookish? <laughs> um, I mean, everyone in Born Against read a lot of books, for sure. Um, but also everyone in UOA read a lot of books, but very kind of like different. Mm -hmm. who, who, who read what? Like, you know, specifically if I remember like being on tour, like, you know, Tony might be reading like a Philip K. Dick, Dick book or something. Um, Sam. Tony Joy of yeah. UOA. And, well, he was in both bands. Oh, you know? true, right. Um, like uh, Sam would always just be reading like everything. He always had, he always had, Sam was like intimidating in a way back then and because he always like, he knew everything and like in terms of like books he was reading or like even like he could, it, it felt like, you know, somehow managed to read the New York Times every day, <laughs> even being on tour in like right. Wyoming or something like that. You know, right? Um, but uh, it was it was definitely like those those two bands. Even though m myself and Tony were in both bands, you know, totally different vibes in in the van on tour, playing records and stuff yeah. like that. Um, whereas like. UOA was always it was this kind of like visceral it was more it was more about just it was kind of like just a band yeah but in a way not whereas like born against it was it was kind of very clear lyric music like it was it was kind of more like I don't know. It's it's really it's weird. It's hard for me to think about in retrospect now. Did it feel like there was a mission outside of just music with Born Against or something like that? Because right, it felt like it. But then because I was in Born Against for the final year of the band, yeah. when it wasn't, they were not like I still, you know, as a pushing forty-seven year old person right now, like there are still adults that will come up to me, like even at the restaurant, and say, "Well, you were in." the shitty era of Born Again. <laughs> I disagree. Which, which is kind of funny to me because, like, you know, Born Against was my favorite band, and I got to join my favorite band. Right. So. Uh, you were like Henry Rollins. In a way. Sort of. <laughs> That's exactly what he says about Black Flag. Um, so, it, like, when they're like, oh, it was, they're sort of like, well, you made it shitty, you know? Like, <sighs> it hurts a little bit. It even hurts to this day a little wow. bit, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I get it, and I realize that, like, you know, the music at the end was much different than the first Born Against Records. Like, but in a way, like, in my mind, it, it kind of got weirder. I think um, it definitely did. I think we're really getting to a Rollins analogy here <laughs> because Black Flag changed in the same way, I think, relatively. Um, I don't want to get too in the weeds on punk stuff, but I do love it. How would you how would you dip, typify or describe the later born against that you were in versus the early born against that these purists? Oh. <laughs> what are some adjectives? Um, I mean, I think like I often find that people that tell me that I was in the shitty era of born against are people that like a much more straightforward style of mm. of hardcore. People wearing Judge T-shirts. Eh, maybe that's maybe that's like a little extreme, okay. you know. But um, whereas people that say like, oh, well, I, I thought the later stuff was even better, are people that tend to skew towards like the, the weirdo yeah. vibe, you know? So, so when, when people do say you were in the shitty era of Born Against Tech and at least my little thought bubble is like, well, yeah, maybe, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> at least it was weird. Um, what's the deal with bay leaves? 
Amazing. Bay leaves are incredible. I can't get my head around them. They, I mean, I pr much prefer the dried version to the fresh version. This uh -huh. will get me in trouble with a lot of uh, far farmers, maybe. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, um, we cook all sorts of stuff with dried bay leaves. And they impart this insane fragrance to things that's different depending on what it is. Like they adapt to certain things. Like you can cook a tomato sauce with bay leaves and you'll get a certain specific kind of flavor. Or you can take some beans, dried beans with onions and fennel and garlic and some bay leaves and cover that with water and throw it in the oven. And you get a totally different thing where they they sort of adapt, like they don't taste the same. Mm. They they adapt to what they're they're partnered with. They always feel so arbitrary to me when I see them in a recipe. Do you know no, what no, I mean? No. Definitely, yeah. they're definitely not arbitrary, okay. especially like um, if you read, say, like a, a cookbook, like a Chris Bianco cookbook. If he's using bay leaves in something, yeah, they're there. That's there for a reason. You okay. Know, so, um, and then a lot of times, like at the restaurant, we sometimes we'll have something and. And because it's so small, I get to talk to people a lot. Yeah. And the, I get to see their immediate reaction or I'm outside t taking out the trash, changing the trash or changing the water. Um, and they'll say, well, what's, this, what's, this, what's the spice in this? And, yeah. and I'm not like particularly want to disguise or hide anything. You know, so if, somebody, if somebody's interested enough to ask me that, I'm going to be like, okay, well, what's in that? Like, like or was, I think so the other day someone was like, what's the like really sharp menthol flavor. And I was like, menthol, what do you mean? And then I was like, oh, that's the bay leaf. But they don't taste menthol -y. They taste menthol -y in these beans, but they didn't taste menthol -y when we made this kind of like, almost like meat glaze to marinate uh, tofu skins, you know? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, there's like all sorts of different oils that get unleashed when you heat them too, so. I'll reconsider them. Yeah, yeah definitely. Again. I mean, I never leave them out when it says to use them. I just right. always like, what is this fucking thing? And no, then you got to take it out before you eat. And Oh, we just grind them up. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and okay, well, that's our, our final question, which is not where I expect it to end up. But I love garlic, but I hate handling it. It's like the worst thing to unwrap and chop. Do you have any garlic tips? Garlic, yes. I actually have a pretty... Um, strained relationship with garlic too because coming from the heavily vegan and vegetarian punk rock world of the late 80s early 90s um nobody knew how to cook garlic mm. restaurant or your 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 friend that you stayed with you know like garlic is really powerful um and fresh garlic as opposed to older garlic is very different yeah and cooked garlic as opposed to raw garlic is very different. Like raw garlic is great, but raw, gar raw garlic used improperly sucks. How can it be used improperly? Like raw garlic, you really need to like use minimally, or if you use a lot of it, you need to treat it in the recipe in, in a certain way where you're kind of like denaturing it a little bit, like okay. with acid or other things that can, they, where it can disperse. I see. Where that's like, I mean, I think hummus is like the perfect example of that. Like terrible hummus is usually terrible because of raw garlic deployed <laughs> shittily, you know. Okay. Whereas like good hummus is like, that's whoever made that hummus, be it a company where you bought a prepackaged thing or at a good Lebanese restaurant or whatever, like they have thought about this and they're like, I'm gonna incorporate this raw garlic in a way yeah. where I get the flavor and the floral qualities of it without it, without making this person that I'm serving it to belch garlic for the next eight hours. Yeah, you know? yeah. And in terms of handling it. That's the hardest part for me. Um, I mean, at the restaurant, we just wear gloves, you know? Yeah. Um, although at, I don't particularly mind like having like garlicky fingers, you know? Yeah. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're making ice cream or sorbet after that, you definitely don't want it to taste garlic. Uh -huh. so. But uh, I mean, the, the main thing with garlic, especially like if you if you're living somewhere where you can get fresh garlic at the at a market yeah. where you know it's like very fresh, like yeah. that's the way to do it, you know. Yeah. Um, or from a, a purveyor where you know that if it's even like has been like hung and kind of aged a little bit, it's still 
good stuff. You're not because you can buy whole peeled garlic pretty much anywhere in bags. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of that stuff is like it's so old and it's like kind of fermenting. Yeah. And like not not fermenting in a good way. Um, fermenting in a trash way. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. that's yeah, trash definitely ferments. Um, but uh, yeah, no. But garlic's great. Like I. I, I almost every when people come to Superiority Burger and say they have a garlic or onion allergy, yeah. that we only have one thing that they can get, and they usually try to debate with me. Yeah, because usually when it comes up, when any sort of allergy comes up, you know, we run a restaurant, we don't want to kill anyone sure. or hurt anyone, like especially for nine dollars, you know, <laughs> like it's not worth it to me. It's not worth it's not worth it to you. Yeah. So. But when garlic and onion allergy comes up, usually whoever's working the register comes and grabs me, and the person usually tries to say, well, what do you have that has no onions and no garlic? And I, 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 I'm immediately like, we have this burnt broccoli salad. If there's nothing in it, I can assure you. And they're like, well, what? I was like, I, I, I make all this stuff. Like, I'm not, it's not, a, I can't, you can't win this conversation. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to help you, you know, so. Yeah. Thanks again to Brooks for coming over and talking with me. It was fun to have him at my house. I got to introduce him to my favorite rocket fuel of a British tea brand, which is the Yorkshire brand, whose slogan is, let's have a proper brew. Uh, And as usual, I learned something new about Brooks during our conversation. He's endlessly surprising as a friend. Uh, I had no idea before this just how much of a Shakespeare fan he is. Whether you're an ambitious home cook or not, I really recommend Brooks's books. Uh, Fancy Desserts covers the Del Posto era, as well as some interesting tidbits from his past as a musician. And the Superiority Burger Cookbook is just what it sounds like and is also excellent. Uh, And please do yourself a favor and visit Superiority next time you're in New York. Or if you live there, go down there today, even if it's for the second time in 24 hours. This episode was recorded by me at home in Mount Washington, Los Angeles. All the music is Bach, arranged and recorded by Cyrus Garamani. I had generous post-production help from Lars Kresslins and Justin Geller back in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You can find more Apology stuff, including the magazine and some merch at apologymagazine.com. And feel free to write me with suggestions, complaints, ideas for guests, recommendations of books, at hello at apologymagazine.com.